I'm here tonight to talk about engineering entrepreneurship. What it means to be an engineer and entrepreneur, how we think, how we behave, how high the bar has been raised by those who came before us. So why are you engineers? <laughs> we second everything else. <laughs> I like that. I love it. I love the interaction. Feel free to speak out. Please, please. Why are you entrepreneurs? Probably for the same reason we all are. It's fun. It's in our DNA. Some people are born dancers. Some people are born musicians. Some are born artists. We are born engineers. We are born entrepreneurs. We are hardwired at birth. We probably remember the things we did as children that if anyone with half a brain was watching would have concluded that we were going to be engineers, nerds, geeks. You know all the things I'm talking about. Taking things apart, figuring out how things work, observing the world and the universe around us. While all my brothers and sisters were inside at night playing, I was outside gazing up at the stars, letting my imagination go wild. We also probably remember our first entrepreneurial experience. I remember mine like it was yesterday. The year was 1963. I was eight years old. We lived in a very affluent neighborhood in Tampa, in South Tampa, called Palmasia. Now you've got to remember, in those days, there was no internet, no cell phones, no iPods, no computers. We had three things. A telephone, a TV, and a radio. And the TV was black and white. One day, when I was playing with my toys, I came across a deluxe potholder loom kit. You know those kits with the square looms and you pull and stretch the little uh, little uh, uh, pieces of material across, like a little loop. The yarn, I guess you call it. So I started playing with this one day, eight years old. I was, in, I was intrigued by how this little thing worked. You strung a little yarn across, and you laid it up in one direction, then you ran your little wire through, and you grabbed, you hooked onto the other piece, and you ran it through, and weaved it back. And at the end of the day, you figure you make a little pot holder about the size of a piece of bread. Well, I got through that in a couple of minutes. That was kind of fun. I tried it again and again. And I was getting good at it. I was pulling double stitches. I was pulling triple stitches. I was pulling middle stitches into the part where you didn't even, where you were supposed to pull stitches. I was making red, white, and blue colors, all different colors. I was making checkerboards. I was making three-dimensional pot holders. This was my earliest exposure to what I now do as an engineer, which is VLSI partitioning, floor planning, placement running, at eight years old. Yeah. I became a potholding maker son of a gun. <laughs> I could make one heck of a potholder. The weeks went by and my potholders were starting to stack up now. And I'm just cranking away in these things, man. I'm, I could do it with my eyes closed. One day, I'm, I'm, I'm standing there, thinking my potholes, and I look down at my stack, I'm going, you know what, I'll bet people will buy these. I'll bet people will pay me for these. So I got them all together one weekend, stuck them in a bag, walked out my front door, and walked half a mile to a supermarket on Henderson Boulevard. It used to be called B&B. &B. Then it was You Save, and now it's Farmer's Market, I think. Right there near uh, Dale Mabry and Henderson. I walked from my house, at the corner of Parkland and McDill, by myself, my parents, may they rest in peace, to this day didn't know I did that. <laughs> I got my little bag and I walked up to B&B. I went to school with the family that owned that restaurant, or that owned the supermarket. I walked in the front door of the supermarket, and I remember this like it was yesterday. As I walked in, right in front of me was a checkout counter within 10 feet of the door. So when I walked up to the checkout counter, I peered over this 
checkout counter was the size of a mountain. That this woman, this young woman, standing on the other side of the, in front of the cash register. And she looked down at me and she said, young man, can I help you? And I said, uh, yeah, I want to sell my pot holders. And she went, what? I said, I want to sell my pot holders. <laughs> Just like that. And this woman started laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> so hard that she keeled over on the, on the counter. And I'm standing there wondering, you know, why is she laughing? Is it my pot holders? Is it me? So without being phased, I, I turned and just walked right back out the front door. And the front of the sidewalk, which had an overhang and a cover, and I sat down, I pulled my pot holders out, and I set up shop. Here comes my first customer. This woman came up. I stood up, grabbed my pot holder, and I said, ma'am, would you like to buy a pot holder? She says, no, thank you. She walked in. Next person came up. Another woman walked up. She walked past me and said, ma'am, would you like to buy a pot holder? She said, no, thank you. She walked in. A third woman came by. Ma'am, would you like to buy a pot holder? No, thank you, young man. Not to be discouraged, the next, my next customer came. She walked past me. I said, ma'am, would you like to buy a pot holder? And she stopped. And my heart starts to beat. <laughs> this was an epiphany moment for me. She stopped and she goes, how much, young man? How much? <laughs> how much? How much? I didn't think about how much. <laughs> she goes, well, how much, young man? And I, I don't know how, where the words came from. I said, they're a nickel. Oh. And she goes, I'll take one. Now, that moment, I wish I could capture and sell. That very moment that that happened. Because now I'm standing there. <laughs> She reaches in her little purse, pulls out a nickel, and puts it in my hand. She said, thank you, young man, and took my pot holder and walked in to do her shopping. Within a few minutes, another woman's coming up. So I took the nickel, slid it in my pocket. She comes up and says, ma'am, would you like to buy a pot holder? She stops and she goes, oh, how much, young man? And I'm like, this is too cool. <laughs> I said, a dime. And she goes, I'll take one. I'm going, oh, my God, this is incredible. <laughs> she gives me a dime. This woman gave me a dime. She gave me a dime for doing something I love doing. This was foreign to me, this whole concept. A few minutes later, another woman came by. And as she's walking by, I said, ma'am, would you like to buy a pot holder? And she goes, how much? And I'm like, <laughs> a quarter. <laughs> And she goes, a quarter? I went, for two. <laughs> and she goes, I'll take them. <laughs> she paid me a quarter for two potholders. And this was, this was too easy. Al was a millionaire. <laughs> at that moment, I became a millionaire. I was Warren Buffett at eight. A few minutes later, I'm standing there, and now I'm, I'm like going crazy. I mean, seriously, this is like, I'm like, I wanted to tell everybody. See what's going on here? I get a tap on my shoulder, and I look back, and there's a man behind me. He's got black trousers on. He's got a white shirt buttoned up with a black thin tie on, short sleeve shirt. He says, "I'm going to have to ask you to leave." I didn't know who this guy was. Well, I said, "Okay." Packed up my bag, put my potholders back in my bag, and I walked a half a mile back home. A week later, I had my second entrepreneurial experience. This time, it was selling lemonade. It was Sunday. Now, this is important because where we lived, on the corner of Parkland and McDill in South Tampa, there's a huge Bayshore Baptist Church across the street from my house. So I figured, I know on Sunday, there's 1,000, 10,000 cars out there. So on that Sunday, my mom took us to church. We go up to the Greek church because we're Greek. We went to the Greek Orthodox church that morning. Came back home. I ran in the house, grabbed my table, took it out with my chair, came back, took the minute, made, made my lemonade, dumped the ice cubes in, and I went outside and I set up shop in front of my house on Parkland Boulevard right as they were coming out of church or later on. And there I was. 
my pitcher of lemonade, my cups, and my potholders. <laughs> I don't remember making much money that day, but I had a great time. That's a true story. So what's common about our DNA? We're pioneers. We're innovators. We're fearless risk takers. We're game changers that thrive on adrenaline. We want to go where no one has gone before. We want to change the world. One potholder at a time. I've concluded there are four critical attributes that all successful people possess. And I've summed them up in this simple acronym. Fiat. No, it isn't the little <laughs> Italian car that you probably see buzzing around town. And it's not the car manufacturer. No, I'm, uh, however, this Fiat can take you places. This Fiat can take you places and help define who you are. F is for focus, as in stay focused on the prize. People are going to tell you, you can't sell potholders today, but you hold your course. You remain undistracted, unwavering, and you remain relentless. I is for innovation. This is your secret sauce, people. You're a potholder your intellectual property. This is what sets you apart from everybody else. This is what you bring to the table. A is for awareness. You have to know what's going on in the world or the universe, and not just in technology, but also in politics, in society, in business, in religion, in government, 